due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. So if you're throwing a seven days a week, 24 hour surveillance on anybody, you require up to 30 people dedicated to just watching one suspect. And as you walk, as the suspect walks around and talks to individuals, maybe those other individuals are important, maybe they're not, who knows, you need to put other people on those other people you've just identified. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by author and former CIA officer Aki Peretz. And on this episode, we discuss the liquid bomb plot from 2006, which is the plot that is responsible for you not being able to carry liquids in your hand luggage when you go on an aeroplane. Those rules are due to change in the next few months. So on this episode, we discuss the liquid bomb plots, we discuss the largest counter-terrorism operation that foiled it, and we also have a brief chat about the restrictions slowly being lifted, and in particular at London City Airport where they have new scanners that apparently are more effective, which means you won't have the restrictions with liquids in your hand luggage any longer. And we talk about whether that's a wise thing or not. So um, this is a jam-packed episode. I hope you enjoy it. And just before we start, I just want to thank all those who are supporting this podcast on Patreon. If you're not currently supporting the show on Patreon, please consider it. You now get access to a new show exclusively for Patreon listeners called Extra Shot. And depending on which subscription level you pick, you'll either get a set of free Secrets and Spies coasters or a free Secrets and Spies coffee mug. So I hope that sounds pretty cool. Um, we also have a Redbubble merchandise store. And if you're not in a position to support us financially, that's absolutely fine please just leave a five star review on your podcast app all reviews help boost the algorithm which helps people find the show and it's always very nice to find out what listeners are thinking about the show so we do appreciate it you can also contact us on twitter by just going to at secrets and spies we will stay on twitter for now um i can't guarantee how long we'll be on twitter for but at the moment we're currently on twitter and plans are to stay there for the time being so without further ado let's get going i hope you enjoyed this episode i really enjoyed this chat and thank you for listening you take care the opinions expressed by guests on secrets and spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast Aki, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good to have you on. For the benefit of the audience, please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your professional background? Sure. I'm a bit of a, a jack of all trades. Uh, years ago, I worked for the CIA, mm. working mostly on East Asia and counterterrorism issues, uh, not at the same time, of course. Um, I worked a lot on Iraq and the the war or part of the war at least because the the conflict continues um and then i sort of broadened out my portfolio to the greater middle east i've also worked on cyber security issues i've worked on open source intelligence issues i now teach at uh, american university in washington dc yeah and i also work at the university of maryland am i right remembering you were on the american version of a tv show called hunted i was i was actually on that television show unfortunately yeah. we uh, I think Hunted is still playing in the UK. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, there was only one season here in the United States, mm. uh, which is unfortunate because it was a lot of fun. It was yeah. so much fun. And I was their senior cybersecurity analyst or whatever my title, my made up title happened to be. Um, <laughs> I was the guy who was like looking up, going through all your computers and, yeah. and your social media, looking to see whether we can find clues to see where you were going to be or where the contestants were going to be. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, from what I understand, is that uh, the ratings were good, but not good enough. And it was a very expensive uh, television show to make. And so, therefore, they didn't renew us. I hear that in the UK, they actually, it's 
it's, it's a lot cheaper to make because they just have just fewer people on it, mm. oh, which okay. was, yeah. <laughs> we suffered from gigantism, I think, on this on the television <laughs> show here in the States. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it was restricted to just one state, I think, whilst in the UK, it's the whole of the UK that the contestants can go on the run and stuff. Uh, well, uh, there were... There were two major states. This is Georgia and South Carolina, but then it dipped into Florida, which is a very big place, and parts of Alabama. Yeah. I think one of the major problems is, uh, which you don't have in the UK, is that different states have different laws about yes. about uh, recording people, and uh, and so let's say if somebody were to, for example, go talk to somebody uh, at a gas station, you know, interview them for a gas station, you have to record the person, but it's a two party consent uh, state. And so it makes it much harder to, you need people to consent to be recorded mm. uh, to, for it to work. And yeah, so th yeah. that was one of the major drawbacks. Yeah. But I think it, was, it actually just came down to too many people, you know, super cops going after regular people. Uh, they, they really needed to bring it down to, you know, six people versus six people or six people versus 12 people or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, I think it's like a two to one ratio in the uk but yeah because you worked with um uh ben owen because he was on the uk version and yes um, yeah no, good guy because i fun enough my only slight connection to hunted very i i many many years ago ben used to do a private version of it where you, members of the public could go and train to be a hunter um and right. i did a, an afternoon surveillance course with him and um fun enough the very topic we're talking about today he used as a reference um for looking out for the extraordinary in the ordinary was the example he was giving and he was talking about how um the suspects that we're going to talk about in a minute were followed into a shop and were looking at bottles in a strange way um so we were being yes. taught to look out for you know unusual behavior in ordinary places so <laughs> yes yes ben yeah. is a he's a really good fella uh mm. danny brooke is yes. also really good yeah. I, I met her as well uh, good folks, good at what they do. A testament to the security service and the police services about how well you can, you have competent, well-trained people doing, mm. doing their business and and protecting the public. Yes, so. yes, indeed, indeed. No, ben was a top guy. I really enjoyed that weekend or that that day with him and uh, Danny mm -hmm. and some of the others. But it was a very interesting, uh, interesting day. So um, I suppose we teased a little bit for the audience there a bit about your books. Your book is called Disruption, and it takes a look at the liquid bomb plot and the largest counterterrorism operation to stop it, which was called Overt. For listeners unfamiliar with this terrorist plot, this is the plot that has led to restrictions on how much liquid any of us can take on a flight. So thank you very much, terrorists, for that. Um, mm -hmm. So before we dive into the book, I'd love to learn a bit about how you went about researching it, because obviously it's a contemporary case and obviously secrecy laws, etc. How did you sort of navigate all that and what how did you kind of go about researching this book well that was uh and it's funny this book uh disruption is an interesting i thought it was an interesting case number one is this affected millions and millions it could have affected millions and millions of people it disrupted it could have disrupted whole industries that uh, the united states and the uk and europe and uh, other places uh, you know global civilian aviation mm. would have been maybe not fatally compromised but very uh, very well damaged uh, had had it actually come about mm. um and it really required incredible resources both in the uk in the us in pakistan elsewhere to really stop this this plot and and I came about this actually this this idea is that uh, what if 9/11 had been stopped mm. what book would or book or books would have come out of that and uh, we all know that 9/11 now 20 years in the past over 20 years in the past uh, really changed the trajectory of so much of the modern world uh, for good and for ill mostly for ill um, but what if you were able to stop that kind of uh, mega plot uh, uh, what would the world have looked like and now we know obviously 9-11 happened. So what if you had a 9-11 happening literally five years after 9-11? Yeah. Or six years, nine, uh, you know, really five. Uh, but we were able to stop that. And why hasn't anybody sort of gone through that uh, and looked at it in a comprehensive manner? And it obviously exists in bits and pieces in, in other places because it was a major plop and then plot. And then it just sort of disappeared from the public consciousness. Uh, I was looking when I was reading contemporaneous accounts, and this happened in 2006, mm. It almost, you know, there's a big, there's a big to do in, in the papers. And then it's just like within a week, at least here in the United States, just disappeared. And obviously in the, in the UK, there were a lot more, there was a lot more that, that went on, uh, in the papers, 
uh, in the public, uh, you, you had you had a whole kinds of other things, but it, it, it disappeared very quickly as well, which is very odd to me as a person who worked on this on this stuff in uh, in the counterterrorism world. Mm -hmm. I might actually add when I went through my when I was doing my interviews, and again, I I'm a former agency CIA person, uh, and I would talk to other former senior CIA people, and if they didn't work on counterterrorism, specifically European terrorism issues. They almost never know anything about this plot, which is really strange. So if you worked on China, for example, you had no idea this actually happened, or you may have read about it in the papers, and then you would, would have gone up and said, oh, that's interesting, and gone about your, about your regular way. I talked to one fella, uh, former uh, CIA counterterrorism person, but he worked on Yemen. So there was no connection to Yemen here. And he says, I'm sorry, I didn't know anything about this plot as it was happening. And he was working the CIA during this time. Mm. So uh, it's interesting how these major issues of of world Im impact or potential world impact occur or, or don't occur. And then everybody, even professionals, kind of move on the week afterwards. Yeah, yeah, it is amazing. I mean, it's, it's a bit like um, when you watch the odd spy movie, there's always like the sequence where somebody at the CIA says that we always, uh, people know about the failures, but never the successes. But this was a hugely mm -hmm. successful operation in the end. Um, enormously successful yeah and 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 for them and for the most part everybody played it very aggressively but also in a way that comports to our mm. ideas of civil liberties and uh our ideas of uh, not fair play but uh uh the way we would hope the security services and the intelligence services and the police everybody acts in a way and the, the legal system i might add uh, in a way that we wanted to act uh, to protect uh, the the public. Mm, mm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Well, uh, can you talk to us about what the terrorists had planned in this liquid bomb plot and how that plan would have played out if they were successful? So the the plot essentially had an individual in Pakistan. He's a, he's a former fellow from Birmingham. He helped train a couple of fellas who went back to London and uh, long story short, one of the major plotters collected his friends from from school, mm. from university, people who live in the neighborhood. And they were they were going to build some liquid explosives, which by the way, anybody can really build themselves mm. if you really know what you're doing, uh, put them into Lucozade bottles. Uh, so remember before you, you know, if you look at a, if you look at a, uh, a soda, a soda bottle. Uh, most people would look at it and, and you go to the store and you find one, you would look at it and say, well, I can tell that this, this top hasn't been tampered with. Mm. You never look at the bottom. And so what they were going to do was they were going to pull out all the liquid from the bottom using a, a needle essentially, and then insert this liquid explosives into the bottle and then seal it up at the bottom and then go transit through uh, Heathrow and get on various flights. And then at a pre-approved time, they would all detonate and this be over the Atlantic Ocean or potentially over major civilian areas uh, in the UK or Ireland or Canada, the United States. Um, and there would be no time to do anything about it. So if you remember 9-11 happens mm. and all this terrible stuff is happening, there are, there are thousands of planes in the air, but it's not like they all sort of fell out of the air. They all uh, imagine if, if there's a juggler and then suddenly the juggler uh, disappeared. But the balls can all move on themselves and they can, you know, all these other planes just landed. They didn't crash. Now imagine if you had no time to know what happened and, you know, suddenly these blips uh, would start disappearing off the radar. Uh, no plane, no plane would know what would happen. And by, by the time all these planes were down, there was potentially seven or eight planes um, that could have been affected. They'd be all at the bottom of the Atlantic. And that means it'd be almost impossible to figure out what they actually did because there'd be no evidence or, or the evidence would be at the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then the question would be, would you get onto a plane after that, knowing that we had no idea, we would have no idea uh, if uh, uh, what, what was the cause of this, yeah, of this attack? Yeah, indeed, I mean, we we kind of like we've had a bit of an experience because of the pandemic of what it was like with almost no flights. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, imagining that without knowing what caused this, um, right? Yeah, uh, and and how many people? So we talk about like um, talk about. 
at least a good couple of thousand of people would have been killed in at least if the planes had blown up over the ocean. But if they'd blown up over sort of like a city, they blew up over London. I mean, that could be quite horrific. Yeah, blown up over London, blown up over New York City, mm. blown up. Let's put it this way. In the flight plan of many of these flights flying from New York to London, and it wasn't just New York to London. It was London flying to New York, but also Chicago, yeah. uh, I think San Francisco, Montreal, some other places. On the flight plan are things like chemical plants mm. and nuclear power plants and who, who knows what else. Uh, so not just flying over civilian areas. You look up in the air and you see fl- planes all over the place. Mm. Uh, not just landing and hitting a, a, an urban area, but mm. also potentially hitting places that, that, that would cause all kinds of other environmental and ecological and, and physical damage. Yeah. Uh, imagine, I mean, honestly, like this, there's, a, there's a nuclear power plant, I believe there are two or three on the flight plan mm. um, across North America, hit any of those things and you, you have a major, major disaster on yeah. your hands. Yes, yeah, sort of Chernobyl or um, or if a chemical plant is like that terrible train crash uh, you guys have had back in the States and is it Palestine? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, East kind of, Palestine. Yeah, right. yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, so so it, your mind starts kind of unspooling these scenarios and mm. so that's why it was so important for uh, the the British government, the American government, Pakistani government, I might add, uh, to really stop these things as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah indeed. There was a similar plot back in the 90s uh, connected to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, known as Operation Bojinka. Can you talk to us a mm-hmm. bit about that one? So the idea with Bojinka was, and this is in the mid-90s, uh, where they would fly uh, a very similar plot where they would take several planes coming from from Asia and then blow them up. Now, this is not, rec- according to what we know about Bojinka, according to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, it did not have, they would put bombs onto planes. This is in the 90s. So you could just get onto a plane, put put something under the, the seat or in the, in, the, in the hold, and then the plate will f- continue on and blow up somewhere. A bit like Lockerbie uh, almost, the, I suppose, yeah. Like a Lockerbie, like yeah. a Lockerbie, yeah, and Lockerbie happened in 80, uh, 88. So, uh, so this would be a very similar thing, and his uh, there was a there's a fellow named Ramzi Youssef who happened to be Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's uh, nephew. He actually dry ran or did a dry run of this of this activity where he got into a flight in the Philippines, and it was one of these kind of uh, ones that made several stops. Uh, he took the first leg, put a bomb underneath his 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 seat. And then got off, and then the flight went on, and then it was a there was a timer on it, and then it blew up, killed a unfortunately killed the the Japanese passenger who was sitting next to him, um, but the plane was able to. Uh, it's actually a very interesting story. Is that the plane the 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 pilot who was a former Philippines, uh, I believe Air Force pilot, despite the fact he's got a massive hole in his in his in his uh, civilian plane, was able to land without getting anybody else killed. Um, so that man's a hero. Yeah. Uh, but it shows that the, that it was that could have worked. Now, uh, long story short, he was thwarted. His the plot was thwarted uh, for a variety of for a variety of reasons. Um, well, actually, a person set fire to his apartment, and then when the police came in and they looked at it, they said like these look like bomb making materials. And the, so according to the one story, is that the guy tried to pay off the police, and normally the the police had we're not going to take your bribe mm. and they arrested everybody. And then Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and, and Ramsey have got, got away, but everybody else was, was uh, arrested. I personally think that's a cover story for yeah. something else. Okay. It hides the hand of the intelligence agencies. But the, in, the, but the funny thing about this is that the Bojinka plot, I, I was, when I first started writing this book, I was utterly convinced that these guys were just uh, uh, copying Bojinka. And yet when I talked to all these former agency people, and FBI people, and I went through meticulously through uh, uh, the the notes found uh, in by the uh, taken by the police and the court records. There was not a single reference to Bojinka at all. Mm. It's as if they didn't know about it, uh, which is really interesting because in two thousand four there was the nine eleven commission here in the United States and a freely accessible book, and they actually talk about Bojinka, and so. Not public knowledge of Bojinka was already out there by 2006, and yet there's not one scrap of evidence that says that the people in 2006, the overt bombers, really was tr- were trying to copy the thing that happened or would have happened 10 years beforehand. 
So that's really interesting. And, yeah. and I talked to a lot of agency people. They said, hmm, that's right. You, you're right. I've never really, there's never been a real connection. It might have just been a coincidence. Yeah. How bizarre. But I suppose, um, yeah, no, it's an interesting one. Obviously, uh, those terrorists A are not big readers, and B, I suppose they had quite a good imagination if they came up with it on their own. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go into some of the plotters. Can you talk to us a bit about Rashid Ralph, who he was, and his connection to the plot, and other terrorist plots as well, such as 7 7 and 21 7, forgive the English dates. Uh. Of course, of course. <laughs> Well, uh, Rashid Ralf, he was born in Pakistan, but he came to the UK uh, when he was a, a baby. Uh, so born in, uh, uh, lived in East Birmingham, and uh, he lived in uh, Washwood Heath. And uh, seemed like a normal guy, nor normal kid growing up. His, his father, they ran a bakery. Uh, long story short, uh, he helped out with the bakery. He goes to, he goes to university, and in the first year, uh, something terrible happens, which is his his uncle gets murdered in East Birmingham. Unsolved murder, even to this day, yeah. I might add. Yeah. And then suddenly Rashid Ralph and his friend Mohammed Gulzar just disappear from the UK. Now, these are both British citizens. Uh, and uh, what, what the police feel, uh, what the police believe was that Rashid Ralf was the assailant. Um, and his friend Gulzar had something to do with it as well. But it was never quite clear why they would have done this, and I, I get into this in the book about why. Goes to Pakistan, connects very quickly with a lot of the jihadist folks uh, uh, there, Qaeda groups, but also these uh, Kashmiri jihadis. It's now 2002, 2003, 2004. 2005, you have all the folks who are interested, uh, who have been radicalized over the last several years, uh, uh, the Muhammad Sadiq Khan, the MSK of 7-7. They connect with Rashid Ralph. They are trained uh, in uh, various camps in Pakistan, and then they fly back to uh, the UK. And, the, 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 so, and then they, they build their bombs. They, they, uh, and they get onto the transport and they get on the underground and they blow themselves up. And it's the worst attack, I might add, in London since World War II um, in terms of casualties. Yeah. Um, 52 people dead, four, including uh, plus four, the four bombers. And then two weeks later, a very similar attack occurs by a person who was also trained by Rashid Rauf in Pakistan, comes back, trains Excel and tries the same operation again. Now, these two cells didn't know each other, uh, but obviously the people who tried two weeks later, the like, 721 or 21-7 folks, um, uh, saw it was a very successful attack on 7-7, so we're gonna try this thing again. Um, unfortunately, they, well, fortunately for everybody else, but uh, unfortunately for them is they messed up the chemicals of the, of the explosives, and so when they pushed the button, when they, they, they connected their, their wires, it, there was a big pop, but it didn't set off the larger explosive. And so they thought they were going to be dead. All these people would be dead. And they wake up and they're suddenly surrounded by all these people who are really upset yes. about being in the same carriage as, yeah. as they are. Yeah, I think some people got burns. There was a similar attempt in Parsons Green in, I think, 2017. Um, where the I think the detonator goes off, but and it leads to a loud bang and lots of smoke. And thankfully, that's mm -hmm. it. That's it. Yeah. And so it's Rashid Ralph had a hand in obviously both of these things. And so now you have a, a British citizen living in Pakistan who has a hand in the worst attack in modern British history. You have another a follow on attack that also could have been a terrible attack. And so the, the interesting thing or not the interesting thing is that for both the 7-7 and the 21-7 attacks, the British government, the British intelligence services, MI6, MI5, the police had no idea they were coming. No idea. And the, here in the United States, no idea. Um, and everybody found out as it was happening that these, and obviously when you go back through your, your data, they found bits and pieces saying that some guy may have gone to Pakistan to do something and maybe we should keep a little eye on it. It, it didn't really, it, di it didn't work. Uh, it, it wasn't enough to shut down Mohammed Sadiq Khan. Now Mohammed Sadiq Khan had a connection to a previous attack or a previous port of attack. Um, but which is interesting is that I had, I, and I didn't know this until I, I began writing the book, that he was in a car with a bunch of other conspirators, but they were all speaking very fast and they had a, I, I believe they had a, they had really thick Yorkie accents and they were speaking in Urdu and they were speaking in Arabic and 
and the the people who were listening didn't couldn't quite understand what was going on because they were all speaking in multiple languages yeah. very fast. Yeah, uh, it turned, and then they after the fact, many years after the fact, they went back and listened to that surveillance tape, and they said, "Oh, it's obviously them talking about a terrorist attack. We just didn't understand at the time." Wow, you know, doing cop work, doing intelligence work mm. is they're done by people. And people make mistakes. Mm. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to criticize the people who are trying to get this thing done on a on a deadline. Um, but uh, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. You just want to try to win as many times as you can. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, um, Rashid Ralph was sort of, in a sense, the he was sort of coordinating this from Pakistan. This plot, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. And he connected with a man named Abdullah Ahmed Ali. So could we talk mm-hmm. a little bit about Abdullah Ahmed Ali and how he became involved in the plot and his connection to Rashid? Sure. Ali is uh, born in the UK, comes from a, a, a big family. He had seven brothers and sisters, mm. uh, lived in Walthamstow, uh, nice place. Grew up, went to went to school, had a university degree. Around this time, you know, there are, there are inklings that he fell in with some bad folks uh, that that said, you know, this is the 90s, so when the Taliban first controlled Afghanistan, people who said that, well, the Taliban is, uh, are actually running some a wonderful place in Afghanistan. Uh, Ali goes to the Pakistan, on the Pakistan-Afghan border. There are a, a variety of camps for displaced people, and he worked it there for a while, and he said he was very moved by this in a, because there are all these people fleeing the conflict. And uh, you had children dying of, of totally manageable diseases, but they just did not have enough clean water or medicine or what have you. And it's very cold up there in the mountains. Uh, he comes back and he goes to Pakistan over and over and over again. And at some point, he actually connects with Rashid Rauf uh, because Rashid Rauf is a, is a British citizen and can converse very easily with uh, other British citizens who are interested in the greater jihad, especially now at this point, the United States and Britain and uh, coalition have, have, are in, have thrown out the Taliban and are, are waging this sort of gray war with, with the Taliban and other organizations. And there were some hundreds of, of British men mm. who wanted to, to sign up and fight, fight the, the infidels in Afghanistan. Now, obviously, a lot of these guys would go there these guys have no military experience. They would go there and maybe they would commit an attack or two and then they'd be put on a place. They'd be, they would say, like, there's a British citizen doing bad things, working with Al-Qaeda, working with the Taliban, working with other groups. Uh, they become a priority target and they don't last too long. Um, and so Rashid Ralph understood this. So he never really... Go, going to Afghanistan meant basically you're going to die mm. uh, at some point. And mm. so he decided or he he surmised, reassessed that it is much better to take people who are trained in explosives and some rudimentary uh, warfare and send them back to their home countries. Now, he was the quarterback, if you will, uh, to use an American term, for the Brits. And so he had his fingers in a lot of British and English speaking efforts. And that's why he was the perfect person to interface with Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Abdullah Ahmed Ali. And so he convinced Ali, who from from contemporary sources says like, what a, he was a, he was a smart guy. He was a, a motivated individual, a charming person. Why don't you go back and we'll, we'll put you into play once we figure out what we're going to do. Mm. And so that's what he did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he made an attractive kind of prospect effectively, kind of a bit like a, to use that term, clean skin. You know, he didn't really arouse much suspicion. He was a family man, wasn't he? And so on. Yeah. He was a family mm. man. Uh, one major issue is that he had no criminal background. Yeah. Um, uh, and so uh, there's nothing, uh, you know, th- something like 300,000 British citizens go to Pakistan every year. Mm. So it, it's not an abnormal thing for, for many people to go to Pakistan, mm. uh, you know, for family reasons or for work or for yeah. or what have you. And so he was, he's just one, he's just one of these people with no criminal background whatsoever. Yeah. And so it was, it was easy for him to come back yeah. and reintegrate into his, into his life. Yeah, yeah. And um, was it this trip or was it a different trip? He came back and he actually inadvertently drew the attention of the security services. And this might, this this lucky break, I suppose, may well have been the uh, um, the kind of key thing for sort of discovering this plot, really. So this is what you've actually hit on. Mm. And I spent months trying to figure this out mm. because nobody would really cop to this. So June 24th, 2006, he comes back from one of his major trips from Pakistan yeah. and uh, the folks rifle through his his luggage and they find batteries mm. 
in his in his luggage. There's nothing wrong with carrying uh, several dozen batteries. Yeah. I'm like, why is he bringing batteries? This is what a weird thing for this guy to have. Yeah. Do we arrest him? It's not illegal. Like it doesn't it doesn't even make any sense why we'd have let's say three dozen batteries. Um, but they said this is uh, this is the tip that the MI5 told uh, the Metropolitan Police. This is the tip that we need to throw surveillance on this guy. Mm-hmm. All right, and then. But they didn't do anything. They packed it all back up, put it in his luggage, and then he picked up his luggage in the carousel and then left. Yeah. yeah. Here's here's the part that is a mystery, even to me. Why would MI5 target his luggage at that time when he was not suspected of anything officially? Mm. And the only thing that I can come up with is they had gone through his luggage beforehand. Yeah. Because in the court documents, they said, well, he brought back you know, Tang, you know, that, that orange drink, mm, mm. that so, so that powdery drink, it was in his luggage from a previous trip. Now, obviously you can, you can get, you know, liquid, you know, you can get dry Tang, you know, these orange uh, mixes in the UK as well. Not a problem. Why is he bringing this back? Yeah. And how would the authorities know this? Yeah. Had they not gone through his luggage beforehand? So does that mean that he was being targeted for some other reason? And my guess is he was. Yeah. Now, uh, and this is this is this is the part, and I don't want to. Uh, I could never get to the bottom of this, and I'll share it with you and yeah. your and your listeners. Yeah. Was he being targeted because he's a man of a certain age of Pakistani or Kashmiri heritage, mm. and he's transiting through Heathrow? Mm. Was it some sort of racial uh, targeting of some sort? Mm. Possibly. Number two is he had been in communication with a 21-7 bomber who happened to live in the same neighborhood as him. And he's taking a phone that he had been talking to a known terrorist and then flying to Pakistan. Mm. Maybe that was the reason why he was, he was targeted. Yeah. But the point is, is that whether it was a potential sort of civil liberties issue Mm. or Mm. in my view, I think it was because he was, he was legitimately talking to a known terrorist and uh, using the same phone back and forth. Um, that's why they went through his luggage over and over and over again, yeah. but they never said anything yeah. and they never hinted that they were doing this. Suffice to say in June, they said, we got to start watching this guy. This guy's acting really suspicious. Mm. And so they started watering, watching these people. Yeah. Um, and I might add, uh, it is unlike what you see in the movies. It's actually really difficult to surveil anybody. I talked to the head of Met Met surveillance. Yeah. You need a, you need seven to 10 men mm. or women. Uh, on a person every eight hours, and you know, because it gets tiring watching mm. somebody. So, if you're throwing a seven days a week, 24 hour surveillance on anybody, you require up to 30 people dedicated to just watching one suspect. And as you walk, as the suspect walks around and talks to individuals, maybe those other individuals are important, maybe they're not. Who knows? You need to put other people yep. on those other people you've just identified. Yeah. And very, and you have to deconflict everything because you don't want the the suspect to see you. Mm. The suspect, especially a person like Ali, who's involved in some sort of terrorist activity mm. uh, or potential terrorist activity, is going to be pretty paranoid to begin with. Yeah, and so he's going to suspect everybody's watching him at all times. And uh, and in this case, it, they were, but uh, the Met and MI five and and uh, other entities within the British government were very, very competent mm. at surveillance. And so they could surveil him the entire time without him actually noticing. Yeah. And and there is a real art to surveillance. My one day's experience of it uh, <laughs> is, mm-hmm. is very complicated because you've got to communicate with your colleagues. You've got to keep a log of what you're watching. And on top of that, you've got to exercise a level of tradecraft where you don't look like you're following people. Um, and mm-hmm. you've got a bit of blend into environments and all sorts of very complex stuff um, oh yeah, yeah. It, it, and it requires a lot of focus mm. and uh, you know terrorists don't take the weekends off or 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 sort of suspects in general i don't just say terrorists but let's say you're a i don't know a, 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 a russian agent walking mm. through london mm. they don't take they don't take days off i mean you have to you you have to commit every day so these people who are surveillance officers they miss birthdays they miss anniversaries they miss their kids you know, football matches, they miss, they miss all these things. And it really wrecks your, your social life or your personal life. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and so, uh, and eventually, and people burn out, mm. people get tired of this. Mm. People love it. Some people love it, but yeah. some people, most people say like, listen, I can only do this for a certain amount of time. And then I, I have to, 
have to go on holiday. Yeah, well, it requires an awful lot of thinking because my memory of it was um, you have to have very good short-term memory, which I don't. Um, mm-hmm. I don't have a photographic memory. And I don't have a particularly great short-term memory. So to be able to remember like uh, registrations of a car or, or um, I don't know, what somebody's just done and stuff like that is quite complicated. So, uh, you know, hats off to these people. Yeah. Incredibly yeah. complicated. Oh, yeah. And you have to, again, you it, it's not just one person watching it, which obviously might be mm. easier because it's just one person. But if you have a team of seven to 10 people, you have to make sure that uh, you're deconflicting uh, at all times. Mm. And you have to, you know, one person watching from one dis- uh, one vantage point and another person watching from another day di- will see different things. Mm. Well, which one was correct? Mm. Unclear. Sometimes uh, one is correct and one is one is not. Or uh, it's it's very difficult. And I might add, by the way, what if somebody goes into a place where you know there are no other people? So uh, yeah. there, there's a there's a it's not in my book, but in another book they talk about if you're being surveilled by uh, 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 you feel like you're being under surveillance, you go to a lesbian bar and just sit at the bar and just wait and just watch the door. And if men show up through that door, you know you're being surveilled. Yeah. Because it's overwhelmingly men who are doing this surveillance. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. there are women too doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, good tip. <laughs> yeah, good tip. Good tip. <laughs> oh, dear. well. Um, what sort of tradecraft were the plotters using to conceal their plans? Well, this is in the in the era of mm. internet cafes. If you remember that, I don't even know whether they exist anymore. Some do. But, I, I uh, do. Know. I I used to go to Walthamstow quite a bit many years ago because a friend there. And I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm through reading a book, I'm thinking, I'm sure I've been at least in one or two of those places, but they, some still exist. And there's one in particular that does really nice cakes. I can't remember the name of it, but I will definitely have to check it out now. But uh, <laughs> Well, what, what, what's funny, I have a friend in Walthamstow as well, yeah. and I said, hey, have you considered like going to this one uh, uh, <laughs> mechanic shop or this wood shop? Because I know where exactly it is. I know what the clerk's name is, yeah. so you should go in there and see what they're still there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they were, suffice to say, they were much more common uh, 15 years ago. And what these guys would do is they would go into these, they felt that it's very difficult to, to maintain surveillance on a throwaway emails, burner emails. Mm. Um, I would send an email to Pakistan, but it would not be super, uh, it would only be to this one person in Pakistan. And I'm in a, in a, in a, uh, internet cafe. And then once you leave an internet cafe and you leave, they usually wipe what you've been doing because maybe you've been looking at some bad things or downloading malware and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so they're very good about wipe uh, internet cafe. Good internet cafes are good about wiping uh, these things. Uh, They would use burner uh, emails. They'd use phones. They would they use multiple uh, pay phones to to talk to each other. They thought that generally they could sort of um, thwart any surveillance. Again, they didn't know how much surveillance was on them. And at one point, there was just nothing. Mm. Uh, for a long time until until MI5 says, you've got to start watching Ali and just Ali. Um, he didn't know what was going on. Um, but as the plot progresses, they started to pull in national uh, level efforts. So GCHQ, mm. NSA, MI5, MI6. So for, for your listeners, I don't know if you know this, but that we uh, the United States has signed a treaty with... UK, mm. uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and it's been around since the 46 and then into the 50s, uh, where we just do not spy on each other. Yeah, We just don't. And so things that happen in the UK are the UK's purview. Yeah, And so it requires, even though the United States can say, listen, you should really be watching these people. Here's some intelligence saying that this so-and-so is a bad guy, mm. or here's some telephonic information that you should know about. Um, it was really up to British law enforcement, British intelligence services to actually uh, collect all the information and send the guys to watch them. Yeah. CIA Makes could sense. do anything. Makes sense. Yeah. 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 This is not true in other places, by the way. No. I might add. No. Yeah. About the treaty. <laughs> it's like in yeah. Germany or somewhere. <laughs> right. Right. So, for example, mm. the United States is not collecting intelligence on the British prime minister. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're not collecting on, let's say, the French president mm. or the German and it's not like the Brits are not collecting on these folks. And it's not like the Germans are not collecting on the French and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it makes everybody's sense. a suspect. <laughs> um, now, there was a bit of behavior by is it Asad Sawa and um, Abdu Ali. They were having a kind of conversation in a park that drew attention to them. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So Ali meets up with this fellow named Asad Sarwar, mm. who the police had no idea who this fellow was. They meet in a park. 
uh, in Walthamstow, a beautiful place, um, Lloyd's Park, uh, which I've been to. It's a lovely place. People go with their kids and they mm. kick around a ball and it's very nice. Um, they get in the middle of a, a large green area and they put, they lie down and they put their hands over their mouth and they just talk to each other in the middle of this green area, green area. And they just talk to each other. And what this means was, and, and the cops who were surveilling them, they didn't know what they were doing. They were just two grown men lying to each other, talking to each other, very close to each other with their hands over their mouths. Mm -hmm. And it was only afterwards that the, a police, uh, uh, sorry, I believe a, a security service officer said, this is what they're doing, is they're trying to defeat lip readers and defeat any microphones over there. And it's very effective because mm. they're in a public place. So they know they're not in a, a room which might have a microphone in it or a, a video camera. Uh, and they're talking and they're not doing anything illegal. They're just doing something very alert if, if you know what you're doing. And so this is how we found out about Mr. Asad Sarwar, who turns out to be the quartermaster for this entire plot. Mm. Up until then, the police had no idea who they were, who he was. He was just another person. So now, we've, now the the uh, the UK security services and the and the Met put a lot of efforts on him. Now, unfortunately for the Met, Assad Sarwar lived in High Wycombe, which is the Thames Valley Police purview, and so the Met couldn't send anybody there. And so now you had to bring in another police force, who is much I mean, they're competent police force, but they're much smaller uh, in terms of resources. Mm. And now you need to follow this guy Assad Sarwar, and there were these other folks who were kind of tangential to the plot. Uh, you now needed to surveil these folks in a totally different part of, not totally different, but a, in a different part of, of, of the UK, which was requires mm. bringing in other police forces, which requires other bureaucracies, which means that the head of TVP had to go to London every day to talk to their counterparts just to make sure that just to deconflict. And I, I might add, at that time, Britain didn't have a national uh, uh uh, a national police system where they could talk to each other over sensitive about sensitive material. So it physically required the head of the TVP to, to go to London, which is, I don't know, uh, uh, an hour and a half every day on the, on the, yeah. on the, on the that's, train. That's so. about delays and strikes. Yeah. Yeah. Delays and strikes. And so, you know, he, he's, he's a human being with, yeah. with, and he has to do this every day and then yeah. report back to his, his folks uh, back, back home uh, mm. to say, well, this is what we have to do. Mm. Again, surveillance is very difficult. It's funny, Asad Sarwar goes into a wooded area, a very deeply wooded area, very early in the morning at some point. And the the TVP, the, the surveillance officer said, had to make a decision. Do we follow him in or do we not? Because if we follow him in and he literally turns around, he'll see us. Yeah. And so they decide not to do anything. And so he goes into there, he, he has materials with him, and then he comes out with no materials. And now the police are like, I don't know what happened. And we had no idea what happened at the time. Yeah, yeah. it's not easy following people into woods because you were saying earlier about it's not a place we're expecting people. Um, right. And at that time in the morning, what was it, sort of 5 a.m. or something? Yeah, 4 or 5 before mm. dawn. Mm. Um, there's nobody there. I mean, it's a, it's a park, you know. If you go there a little uh, later on that day, people are walking their dogs and jogging and people just wandering around the woods. But uh, at 4 in the morning or 5 in the morning, there's nobody there. Uh, and so if if... Asad Sarwar decides to turn around and sees two police-looking fellas uh, following him. He he would know that the, would, the <laughs> he would know that things were were going to go badly for him. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. And he was hiding, and it turned out he was hiding explosives or explosive components in that in those woods, wasn't he? Yeah, he was hiding uh, uh, precursor materials. He was hiding um, beakers and all kinds of. Uh, devices uh, that you needed to use to to make sure that you were you were uh, making the precursors into a specific uh, you know weighing materials and so forth and so all uh, uh, the chemical set the, the chemist set that you need to to build uh, a weapon or or nothing at all for yeah. that matter these yeah. all are all just just innocent materials that any one of us can buy it's just that he was hiding it all in one place in uh, a wooded area he dug a hole it's a funny, it's a funny thing in, in my book about how he tries to die, dig a hole, but it's very difficult to actually dig a hole. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, so if you want to, if you want to, like a little bit more of the like the office kind of mm. uh, like it's 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 funny because it's comic relief, but it actually did happen. He just couldn't figure out how to dig a hole, 
in the middle of the woods at five in the morning. And he had to look it up on the internet. Yeah. And he says, like, well, if you pour <laughs> some water, so you brought some water, you poured it on the ground. <laughs> you thought that, well, maybe the maybe the ground would just disappear. I said, that's, that's not how you that's not how it works. Yeah. Digging holes difficult. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just I want to quickly briefly touch upon um, the flat in Walthamstow. And I've actually walked past mm-hmm. this flat. I've even got a photograph of it because I'm that nerdy. Um, I wonder mm. if there should be a plaque on it one day saying liquid bomb plot was here. Maybe, uh, maybe. I don't know if that would increase or decrease the value of that flat. But uh, t- can you talk to us a little <laughs> bit about it? <laughs> uh, so essentially, it was a condemned flat mm. on Forest Road, which mm. is a, a major road. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of these terraced houses. And if you walk past it, you would never think anything of it. It just looks like just another house. Uh, they were on the second floor of this of this property. And uh, suffice to say is that, that it went through a very complex series of financial transactions mm. with Ali's family to, to buy this house. And in fact, this, this goes to show, I, I, I might add, when you're writing a book and you want to talk about something very complex financially, you lose your audience very fast because people, people don't really care. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I turned this, I I turned like a week's worth of work of trying to figure out, trying to deconstruct how he he pulled this off. It's about two paragraphs. (laughs) So, so (laughs) gotta, gotta keep, keep the plot moving. Um, suffice to say, he he bought the, his family bought the place, turned the keys over to Ali. And in, in there they, they took the batteries that he had taken and they bought all these Lucozade bottles and they were trying to, they were experimenting because they didn't quite know how to do this correctly because it's never actually been done before. And so mm. they were also shooting these martyrdom videos. And so you can still find some of them on online where they, they, they had all the people who were going to commit this attack. They talk about the injustices of the United States or sorry, yeah. of the West, uh, also the United States of Britain. And we're going to show you this is what happens when you mess with, uh, with Muslims, etc. Um, very, they were very similar to the martyrdom video that was shown in Al Jazeera of the seven seven bombers. Yeah, and so they were they were mimicking them in a big way, and this is where they shot the videos. But surveillance folks, authorities had no idea what was happening inside. Mm-hmm. They had no idea because who knows what's happening in any random house. And so they said we and they but they keep seeing these people go into this house, come out, go in, go out, strangers coming in, coming out. Who knows what's happening here? And so MI5 decided we need to find out what's happening. And so very late at night, they sent in a team and they uh, when they knew that the folks were gone, they went in there, wired the place for sound, wired had some video cameras. Um placed in a variety of, of places and then got out mm. successfully mm. Mm. and the plotters had no idea yeah it's very it's, it, it just showed it's a testament to professionals doing their performing their craft in a way that uh, keeps the criminals from uh, knowing what's happening mm. Mm. yeah because it's not an easy flat to get into because um as you're saying it's on this main road um and neighbors can easily see what's going on um and both from the front Absolutely. and probably from the back i've not seen the back of the flat but i've seen the front so it, it so it must be very difficult for a surveillance team to kind of go in and i was also trying to work out um i'm assuming they couldn't use torches or anything either well uh imagine you're in a this is a busy road there are people walking around um what there was actually i talked about this other uh problem in a different operation that the british uh, the uh, the police were about to go into this building and they forgot that there is an early morning call to prayer in oh, yeah. you know in, in islam and so people are some people are actually up at four in the morning or, or whenever it happened to be and uh so if you go in at two or three in the morning people might see you and you see a bunch of you see two or three men or however many or however big the team was uh, breaking into a building and then going in and then 20 minutes later, or however long it takes, coming out, somebody could see you. I mean, there's traffic on the road. There are neighbors who have nothing to do with anything. They might see you and they would report you or they might say something to the press and then it's all over. Also, Ali or any of the conspirators, whoever had keys, could come home mm. or could come back to this flat. They weren't mm. sleeping in the flat. Mm. Uh, they could just come in and and see and then and then the deal was up. It, it's very difficult to to surveil these individuals. And uh, uh, the British government was very clear to the Americans. The Americans wanted to shut this whole thing down immediately. But you had to convict these people in a court of law, in open court, with evidence. And if you didn't have evidence, Mm. 
these guys would skate and then these Al Qaeda guys yeah. would 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 be free men to do whatever they wanted to do and maybe carry out a plot that that other people didn't know about. Uh, this is the time you they wanted to shut this entire thing down mm. when it happened, as it happened, um, and put these guys away for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. So it's a high, it's a very high wire activity of these that the police that the security services and the British government were trying to pull off yeah. at the same time. Yeah, and you've alluded to there was a sort of slight difference in philosophy between the British and the Americans on this, and the British actually proposed some quite risky arrest plans, almost to the point where people might be able to actually get on the plane with the explosives. Um, and they were proposing this really from an evidence-gathering point of view. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about that and also then about the kind of how the plot ended up wrapping up? Of course. At this point, it's now summertime, mm. July mm. Uh, 2006, pushing into August. The British government, security services, intelligence services are talking to the Americans every day. Prime Minister Blair is talking to President Bush almost every day about this, about this topic. But it's also, it's summertime, people are going to vacation. Uh, George Bush was known to like, I'm going to go down to this like place in Texas and clear brush, which I guess the, the people do in you know rural Texas, clear brush on their 1600 acre ranch and tony blair was was uh, he actually was in the caribbean at the time mm. in august mm. and there was an, a meeting and i heard this from a person who was at the meeting he basically said the brits proposed we would allow this plot to to ferment even more we would allow these people to build their explosives we would allow them to get into their their taxis or whatever drive to heathrow airport go through security with their explosives get onto the planes bound for north america and then the pilot would come on the intercom and say, listen, we're having a, a mechanical problem or a strike or something. We need to deplane. And after they deplaned, then the police would come and arrest everybody. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and you say, thinking about this for more than five seconds, you say, well, what happens if they decide to blow up their plane on the on the tarmac? Or one of these, you know, one of these planes deplanes faster than the other ones and the police grab uh, the, the suspect and the other guys see them. And remember, there are hundreds or maybe thousands of people in the in I think it was Terminal Three at the time because they're they're going to deplane all these planes all at the same time, uh, and then they blow they, they decide to blow up the the concourse or they blow up the plane sitting on the tarmac. That is still a pretty successful terrorist attack. Oh yeah, yeah, a thousand right dead there, <laughs> right there, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so the CIA says, "You got to be kidding me." <laughs> Like, don't do that. These are also American planes, by the mm, way. Mm. So once it became, once it went from a, we're not quite sure what they're about to do, but it's a British only, uh, you know, if they, if they they walk into a, a pub or whatever and they yeah. blow themselves up. That's really a tragedy. That's a tragedy, but it's it's something. It's that's really the the UK's purview to mm. stop. But once these guys get onto planes, and remember, this is everybody in in the United States who is in a position of power went through the agonies of 9-11 personally. People who knew people who lost people, people who uh, th they could not stop it. And they were all marred, marked by this 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 attack. Mm -hmm. They said, once you get onto planes that are American, you know, with the American flag on them, uh, this is now an American yeah. problem in a major way. Yeah. yeah. The funny thing is like, so I, I published a book and I, uh, and I, I reach out to some of the, some of my old people I interviewed and I asked him, hey, by the way, can, can I just ask you whatever happened with that? Uh, what, what did you think? He's like, <laughs> one person, a very senior police officer said, uh, met officer said, oh, we were just joking with the <laughs> Americans. We wouldn't do that. <laughs> and it's like, well, that's really funny because yeah. the Americans thought you were serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't joke about these things. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, so, and it's like, I feel, I feel like this is like one of those lost in translation kind of, kind of yeah. situations because... See, I definitely thought you were serious about this <laughs> uh, and, and reported it back to Washington, D.C., which was reported up to the president. Uh, so so obviously don't do please don't do that. All right. So so things are really coming to a head. Rashid, remember, Rashid Ralph is there in Pakistan and he's he's connecting with the folks back in, in the U.K. almost every day. And this is this is 2006. So they're using Yahoo Mail. Mm and Yahoo Messenger, and they're talk, constantly talking to each other every day to multiple people. It just so happens that the head of CIA, who is a brand new person named General Michael Hayden, and his uh, chief of ops were in Pakistan, just happened to be Pakistan, in Pakistan because he was doing a, a tour of, of 
various hotspots. He's in Pakistan. They talked to the head of ISI, which is the the military spy agency, um, and then the 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 director of CIA goes on to wherever. But the head of ops just happens to stick around to talk to his colleagues, and he spends another couple of days in Pakistan. While he's in Pakistan, he's actually dri- he's in a car, and they're driving to dinner, and so it is the 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 top man in in uh, Pakistan, or the CIA's top man in in Pakistan. There's the head of operations. Mm. Uh, the director of operations, name is Jose Rodriguez. There is a uh, a driver, uh, and there is a senior, uh, the, the person in, in charge of Sea Wing. Um, they're all in the car, and they're all driving to dinner. And they get a call saying Rashid Ralph is a, going to approach a checkpoint. What do we do? And he's in a bus. They they figured out that he's in a bus because he turned up. He forgot to turn off a phone, so they're just watching him as they're driving in some random place in Pakistan. What do we do? And Jose Rodriguez says, "Take him out." And that's what they do. They they don't kill him. They they stop the bus. They know exactly what he looks like. They grab him, yank him off the bus, throw a hood on him, and, and disappears. Mm-hmm. This is the this is the Pakistanis all doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a CIA man on the ground too, um, who is anonymous. That sets into that sets off a chain of reactions in the UK because uh, British authorities said we need to shut down this entire thing, even though we don't have enough evidence. Well, we don't believe we have enough evidence to shut down the plot because once Rashid was gone, Rashid Ralph was gone, everybody else is going to scatter and they're going to destroy all their evidence that they already have, and then we can't make a case. And so they go in, they arrest twenty four people, they charge about a dozen of them, and um, what sets this is now, and then what happens are there are three years of trials um, that occur, and eventually they get a, most of the plotters get uh, convicted of a variety of crimes. There are a bunch of secondary people who are on the periphery who get much shorter sentences, and they're actually out right now, uh, and they're walking the streets of, of the UK somewhere. Mm. Um, so not a clean sweep, but mm. we got most of the bad guys, mm. and sometimes that's good enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing that really fascinated me that you go into in the book a bit is the prosecuting of the plotters was not very straightforward. Um, and I suppose it boils down to the, the the terrorist suspects. A lot of them had all the components for the bomb, but I don't think they'd actually constructed one, had they? Um, That's right. They, they had never put all the pieces together, of the pieces of the yeah. pie together. And then yeah. and they say, let's go do this crime. Let's mm. go. Let's go blow up some planes. Yeah. They never said that. No. And so a lot of this was circumstantial evidence. Um, you have you have men in a in a flat on Forest Road drilling holes into into soda bottles, but that's not evidence of anything. Uh, you have people buying precursors of potentially uh, explosives, but that's not uh, that's not um, evidence of anything. You have videos of guys saying we're going to martyr ourselves, but they never say specifically what they're going to do. Mm. Um, and, uh, you have all this strange connections to Pakistan, which was not admissible in the first trial Mm, mm. because it was considered still top secret. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of it actually was NSA material and the NSA would not give it up. And so they were, some of these guys were convicted. Some of these guys, there were, uh, of, of lesser charges. And they said, we need to charge them with like the actual plot. Mm. And so they went to a second trial and then there was a third trial. Um, and I might add that one of the major people got away scot-free Yeah, because he never commit, he never admitted to anything. He was, even though he's in touch with a lot of these individuals who are part of this cell, he never actually did anything. He never put his finger, there was no fingerprint on a piece of, on a, on something that said, I, I'm going to commit this crime. Mm. And so he, he got away scot-free. Mm. Yeah. And I, and from a, I, I'm not a legal person purist or of the legal profession so i i have very limited knowledge but as a layman it does feel like uh, obviously number one is good that the law is so stringent that it's not easy to um convict somebody of terrorism but at the same time there is a part of me thinking that do we need to rethink terrorism laws a little bit because it can allow plotters to sort of go away scot-free yeah it's this is one of the major major differences is between uk and actually european uh, efforts to fight terrorism and uh, the United States. So the United States, if you look, the feel like people have been uh, convicted of terrorist activities over the last 
no, since let's say 9-11, we regularly hand down 15 year census, 15 to life census for relatively, you know, moving money around or so forth. Not, not violence, but in the cause of some terrorist mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. In the UK, people uh, have been convicted of terrorism offenses and they're out within a couple of years or five years. And that may be good because, listen, you can't keep everybody in prison. But on the other hand, uh, and, and I'll get to this, I want to make one yeah. point as well yeah. about this, is that what happens is a lot of people go into prisons for petty crimes and they link up with some not so great people in, in prison who then, and I hate using the word radicalize them, but convince them to do other activities once they get out of prison. Yeah. And then yeah. they get out of prison after two years, three years, a year, five years. And now they are ready to do something really terrible. Yeah, yeah. I think the mafia call it going to college, don't they? Kind of. You kind of go in and then you learn bigger skills. You learn bigger skills and you also build a network mm. of people that you can connect with. Uh, and that's one of the problems they have in France, actually, mm. is that you have individuals going into, into prisons and they're not terribly well uh, monitored. Mm. And you have a, a variety of factions within the prisons who, who say, and, and they, they find people who are looking for something. Uh, and then they, 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 they convinced them of the, uh, the, uh, a very ugly strain of, of Islam and they send them out and then they go off and do terrible things. And that's why you had the, the, uh, the Kawachi brothers mm. who carried out the Charlie Hebdo. These, these were nobodies. And, but they went to prison for tr petty crimes and they came out and they shot up, uh, Charlie Hebdo yeah. uh, later on. Yeah. And you see this over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. So are, are prisons incubators for political extremism not just uh islamic extremism but uh well, yeah. but other extremists yeah because we've had it with the far right too and and there's been recent stories of like um even sort of mini uprisings within the prison where prison guards are held hostage and things like that um mm -hmm. so yeah they, they're definitely i mean I, I again i'm not an expert on the prison system but it, it does feel like um there needs to be a way to sort of hold these people but sort of split them up so they can't kind of and, and yeah. it's very difficult mm. i mean this is what the british have been dealing with this thing these issues for with the ira i mean yeah. if you're an ira man and you didn't go to prison for something there's something not right quite right yeah and so you know jerry adams spent all these years in prison and all the people who were the tough guys in in the ira spent years and years and years in british prisons and that gave them a certain level of gravitas obviously that they have suffered on behalf of the cause and they didn't give in to to the efforts mm. uh, to moderate them, and so they come mm. out and there. They are hard men, mm. uh, and that's that's very difficult. And here in the United States, we're actually dealing with that now with all these January six types. You know, there are hundreds of these guys. Most of them are sitting, were sitting in the DC jail. They're trying to process them out. And the question is, and and I've written about this in other places, that are we really focused on these guys who are part of a uh, of a uh, I would say radical group? Um, a radical political group which which has a semi coherent mm. ideology mm. um and we we convict them for a couple of years and they're out and then what are they are they out and what if you were part of this group and you said well i really didn't want to have that much to do with these guys i fell in with the wrong crowd et cetera, mm. et cetera. Mm. there's no way for you to leave the organization if you're stuck in prison with these people mm. every day yeah and so you either play with them you, you know you either adhere to whatever the strictures are mm. uh or you're targeted yeah in prison there's nowhere for you to go yeah yeah some sort of de-radicalization is needed i know in mm -hmm. i think I, I think i remember reading is it saudi arabia have some de-radicalization programs that have been quite effective i don't know you know how true that is but i was reading that somewhere so so that's that's a, that's actually saudi arabia has been trying for 15 years yeah. or so uh they help people i mean they they say why do people join radical groups is because oftentimes they're men they uh, they're not uh, they want to find a bride or they have certain limited economic uh, capabilities and so the idea is that you help them learn a trade get married have kids and that moderates people and that's maybe true we just don't know and and the reason why we don't know is that how do you know that somebody's not a terrorist anymore you, you don't know maybe the person who's a qu convicted of terrorism activities is you know terrorism is oftentimes an epithet uh convicted of terrorism crimes as as a 22 year old spent three years in prison now he's 25 comes out how do you know how he's going to behave it as a 45 year old mm. and you just don't no. and 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 more importantly is you can't monitor this guy because he's already done his time mm. and maybe he hasn't done anything so yeah
very complex issue. Very complex issue. But maybe say that for another podcast because I'm kind of conscious of time <laughs> sure. for you today. But um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we sort of part ways today just about what we've been talking about? Well, I think uh, here's an inter- a really interesting fact that I learned. And it's and you don't have to take my word for it because it was in a parliamentary inquiry. And so it's 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 public public knowledge is mm. that in the in the UK, yeah. people who have been convicted of terrorism offenses the question is, what happens to these people after they leave mm. prison? Mm. How many of them go back to being terrorists or, or committing another act of terrorism? And oftentimes you see on the news, especially about that, that terrible attack on London Bridge that killed two people uh, several years ago. But the question is, like, how many of these, there are hundreds of people who have been convicted of terrorism offenses. Um, how many of them are actually returned to terrorism? And the answer is, the data says it's only 3%. So three so the other ninety seven percent just kind of like fade back into the woodwork and lead very quiet lives. Now compare that to other crimes, murder, uh, sexual assault, etc. Here in the United States, if you're convicted of a felony, and a felony is defined as you know going to jail for over a year and a day, especially violent felons, the recidivism rate is over fifty percent, fifty sixty percent, and so you go from three percent terrorism activities to fifty sixty percent for all the really ugly crimes that actually affect most people. Um, the people convicted of terrorism, it actually, they, it's actually maybe from a public policy perspective, it is not that big of a problem. And I talked to a, 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 bear, a, a, law, a defense lawyer, and he's in the book. Uh, and it's like, why is this? What, can you explain to me why this is the case? Because as a former agency person, I assume you're a terrorist, you're a bad person, you gotta go away forever. And what he would argue, and I think the data suggests this, or is it pretty effective about this, uh, is that you, you, get, you get caught up in something, a bad group, you, you do some bad things, and then you're suddenly, you're caught by the police and you're thrown in an interrogation cell and you say, oh my goodness, what did I just do? And then you're separated from your, your cell or your crew or your, your buddies, and it's like, oh my goodness, I've made a really bad mistake with my life. Uh, and then you go to prison for a while, and as long as you don't fall into some with some bad people you come out and you say like i never want to go back to prison i never i'm going to walk on the side of the angels and uh and this is i think true for a lot of people involved in pol- political activities not true for everybody mm. um but um it, it we can either be c- extremely harsh and and put these people in prison forever and throw away the key which costs by the way the taxpayers a lot of money um or we can try to rehabilitate these people. And I think that a pound of, was it a penny of prevention is worth a pound of cure or whatever the, whatever the term is or what the saying is. Um, it's not a, people are going to do bad things and you got to, you have to find the irreconcilables, the Ali's of the world, the Rashid Rauf's of the world. And you have to, those are the people you got to put away for a very long time. Mm. But everybody else, if you have a mechanism to sort of, pull them away from these from these these elements who wanted these chaos elements and it's not just it's not just islamist terrorists it's, it's also right-wing terrorism it's also these neo-nazis it's also the january 6 types if you can pull them away from the people who wanted to cause real violence in our society and you pull everybody else away i think that's a much more effective way to to handle these kind of violent extremist groups yeah yeah i agree I agree. Yeah, no simple answers, sadly, but I, it's definitely, uh, yeah, I think we definitely need to think about that. Mm. I did have one more question I wanted to ask you, if you've got time for it. Fire away. Cool. So in the UK, London City Airport apparently has some new scanners that will allow for easing of the liquid restrictions in hand luggage. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. I have a few thoughts. One is, yes, I talked to Fran Townsend, who was the head of counterterrorism the White House at the time. Yeah. And I, I interviewed her in 2019 uh, for the book. And I asked her, what's to stop this from happening again? And she goes like, nothing. We don't have technical capabilities to actually stop this. And that's why we have the 311 rule, the 100 mill- milliliter rule. And so the idea is that if there are bad people who are trying to pull off a similar attack, having three ounces of liquid or, or 100 milliliters of liquid, you can't really pull it off mm. effectively. Mm. And then the question is like, well, why don't you have multiple guys? Because it's a cell. Uh, they go through the they go through security and they they're in the area of the airport they call it the sanitized area area. They go to the bathroom and they just pour it all into a into a soda can and then and then they pull it off. It's like, yeah. well, that's possible. 
hasn't happened though. And so the thing about this plot was if you actually held up the 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 final product, which again, I might add that the terrorists never actually put together, but the Met put it together and you looked at it and it just looks like an orange soda drink. It doesn't look like anything. And you would only know it if you shook up the, shook the, shook the, the bottle. And then the chemical elements would sort of separate a little bit, but normally it would just look like soda. And so it's an issue of training. It's an issue of an appetite for risk mm. because they're, what is worse? The extremely low possibility that something like this would happen, like a terrorist attack would happen, plane goes, you know, gets blown up or, you know, making sure that your London city airport, which generates millions and millions and millions of pounds every day, presumably works normally. If you've ever flown into Israel, they, they have much more difficult security, much more aggressive security practices, both going flying into Israel and also out of Israel. Fine. They have one airport to defend. Britain has dozens. The United States has hundreds. You cannot, you cannot defend everything. And so there is an understanding that there is always going to be risk in this world. Mm. And maybe somebody decided that they are going to relax some of these rules because there will always be risk. It's how you sort of try to mitigate it as best as you can. So, for example, during COVID, when they start, when the, when the airlines are flying again, you could take hand sanitizer onto planes. Hand sanitizer looks like liquid explosives. It just does. How do you know one hand sanitizer is not really liquid explosives? And the answer is you don't. And yet no planes blew up. So um, I think people, people, we all live in a world of risk. The fact that we get onto into a, uh, an automobile and to drive around, you have a better chance of getting killed on the way to the airport in an automobile than you do flying somewhere. Especially driving in London. Yeah, yeah, driving in London. People get killed every day. Yeah. Every day. And we just sort of say, this is the this is the risk that we, we take. And so air, I might add for your, your listeners, air travel is, is the safest way to travel mm. anywhere. Mm. It's safer. I, I looked this up for, a, for another, uh, for a presentation I did. It's safer than taking the bus. It's safer than trains. It's safer than obviously automobiles or ships. It is the safest. Here in the United States, mm. I mean, the United States is such a huge space, airspace. There are thousands of planes flying around every day that uh, millions of people traveling every, every day. We're a humongous country, a humongous airspace, which takes into Canada and parts of Mexico. The last crash of a wide body plane. So this is the one with a, with a you know, wide body plane was in 1996. That's the last one. I mean, 9-11 obviously happened. That was, that was kind of a, that was something terrible. I mean, that's something that, that was not a pilot error or a mechanical error. Obviously mm -hmm. smaller planes sometimes go down for a variety of reasons, but um, yeah. generally it's a very safe way to travel. I wouldn't be too concerned. No, that's good. Well, Aki, thank you so much for your time. Where can listeners find out more about you and your work and your book? Uh, well, you can find my book wherever excellent books are sold. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I am. Uh, I teach at American University here in Washington D.C., mm -hmm. and I also I work on a variety of things at the University of Maryland yeah. in the state of Maryland in the United States. Excellent. And are you on Twitter or anything for anybody to connect with you? I'm on Twitter. I'm at at, at Aki A K I Peretz P E R I T Z. Excellent. And any of the alternatives to Twitter? Have you have you been tempted by any? <laughs> uh, my feeling is that once Twitter goes down, I'm just going to get off of yeah. social media because it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> I just don't, it just, I, I waste so much time on it. It's like, I, well, I should really do something else with my life. You know, <laughs> I, I should really work out more or something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I feel that. I feel that. I mean, we'll probably get sucked into the metaverse or something else at some point. But <laughs> No, no, not, not getting sucked in. No, I refuse. I, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take up gardening or whatever, you know, uh, you know, as one grows older, that's one. <laughs> Grow tomatoes or something in my front yard at least you now know how to dig a hole properly so that will help with there you, you go there you go it's a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your time today thank you absolutely great talking to you Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. 